Welcome back, everyone. And thank you for staying for this special segment of Lecture of a Lifetime. We haven't actually done this before. Just a reminder to keep your phones silent. And again, we invite you to join the conversation. Audience participation is encouraged. We have a team with mics uh, available out in the audience. So if Amy and Stephanie could just yep, wave, uh, if you have questions that you want to add to the conversation, uh, please, please do so and they will uh, bring the mic to you. Of course, if you want to shout, you can do that too. Um, we want to emphasize, one of, the, one of the ideas behind this panel is emphasizing the impact Dr. Weiss's career has had in the community, the medical profession, and on our future generations. And so joining me are a few special guests that will help me guide the discussion and probably poke a bit of fun of, at Dr. Weiss while we're at it. Um, they may have a few stories to share, but I really encourage everybody to it's meant to be a generative conversation, and if you have questions you want to hop, jump in with, please, please do that. So now I'd like to introduce each guest and invite them to join me on stage. Dr. John Kelly is an assistant professor in neurosurgery in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences in the Cummings School of Medicine, and you heard that he was um, in, in Dr. Weiss's lab. He's a neurosurgeon at the Foothills Medical Center and clinician scientist in the Arnie Charbonneau Cancer Institute and Clark H. Smith Brain Tumor Center. Dr. Kelly completed a PhD in the lab of Dr. Sam Weiss, then clinical fellowship at the Sloan Kettering Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Both Dr. Kelly's research and clinical interests focus on investigation and treatment of glioblastoma, uh, which I referred to in my earlier remarks, and in fact, he was the surgeon who treated my friend who'd passed away. Um, I haven't seen Dr. Kelly since then. Dr. Kelly, come on up. Paul Siska is a Chancellor Scholar currently studying neuroscience and plans to pursue a career in research or medicine. And in fact, it's going to be medicine because he was accepted to both UBC and Western University for, for Medicine and is just waiting to hear from you, Calgary. Paul chose the University of Calgary for his undergrad in part due to its profound research intensive mandate. And being a neuroscience student, he's fascinated by the university's prominent role in the development of the neurochip. This is going to control all of us, right? Yeah. OK. Come on up. <laughs> Dr. Beverly Adams is a senior associate dean of education in the Cummings School of Medicine. Her leadership career began in 1994 as the director of the clinical teaching unit at FMC and proceeded to receive progressive promotions, leading to her current position. As a psychiatrist, Dr. Adams is involved in cutting-edge research for treatment-resistant OCD with MRI-guided focused ultrasound, early psychosis, and clinical trials in schizophrenia and OCD. Please join us on stage, Dr. Adams. And of course, this last guest needs no introduction tonight's honoree, Dr. Sam Weiss. So the, the intent here is that we're going to dive into some really deep themes of mental health and addiction, community impact, public policy, and mentorship. And like I said before, please, uh, please feel free to put up your hand and, and ask, us, uh, ask a question. So we're going to start with this theme of mental health and addictions. And just I really I want everybody to just weigh in as they feel comfortable talking about the, 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 the topics that we're going to be uh, highlighting. Over the last decade, the conversation around mental health has continued to evolve with the pandemic, as I mentioned at the end of our conversation with Dr. Weiss, more to the forefront. So what do you see as being most pressing aspects of mental health support that sh we should be talking about? Is it behavioral addictions? Is it access inequities? Is it early intervention? Is it continuing to work on what we have tried to do for quite a while now, decreasing um, the stigma? Where do we need to go with this? Who'd like to start? <clears throat> Dr. Adams. Well, um, as a psychiatrist, I will start. And I, I, <laughs> I, uh, if this is a bad idea to have Sam and I sitting beside each other. So um, I have to tell you, uh, it's been such a, a pleasure and honor to work with Sam. And I, I um, started my uh, the department head role because Glenda McQueen had, had moved on to, to do amazing other things. And so I had the pleasure of working with, with Glenda and Sam and learning so much. And you heard his inspirational talk today. You can imagine 
what our meetings were like. Um, again, loved coming to work, and he inspired me tonight. I think I need to do more than just MR guided focused ultrasound for OCD. Maybe there's more in my cards. Anyway, around um, mental health, and, and so the answer to what you were saying is, I think it's all of the above. And Sam, you, you, we talked about this before that you you know done so much with the Hotchkiss Brain Institute and the importance of early intervention and. We know that most of our illnesses, 75% of our illnesses start before the age of 24, and we've got a you know, captive group here at the UC. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the Matheson Center for Mental Health Research and Education and uh, how that happened. Yeah, well, you know, the, the Matheson Center was, uh, is, I really would uh, give the credit to Glenda, um, as she brought in her perspective of um, the importance of understanding early changes in brain development that could underlie susceptibility and uh, to mental illness, as well as the transformation from acute episodes to chronic illness. Together, um, we felt that this would represent probably where, if we were gonna pick an area, this is where we should go. And uh, Glenda was also instrumental in helping bring Ron Matheson along to create the Matheson Center. What surprised Ron, and I remember even having this conversation with Harley Hotchkiss, was that you could actually image the brain and see the changes that happen, uh, as well as the response to therapy. And Ron would say, you mean you could get an objective measure, which is very kind of like a businessman's, yeah. like, you know, like, yeah. you're not just telling me this, you can actually measure it? I said, exactly. Yeah. And I said, you know, um, measuring it with imaging complements uh, expert analysis that clinicians provide through diagnosis. And, um, and then before you knew it, Ron was in with uh, a donation that places Calgary, certainly at the center of Alberta, with the integrated youth service opportunity that is forthcoming. And I think that you know, um, there's also a commitment that was made by uh, the current federal government to focus on post-secondary mental health as a priority. And um, part of the, the view that, um, that we, I think, are developing is that um, the context of a university can both be exciting and scary at the same time. Um, it's not just about preparing the young mind for what the expectations are, but also for taking a wellness approach as soon as they arrive, right? So that, and they understand that the wellness is both their physical wellness and their mental wellness. And I think the other important element that a university provides is the role the peers can play. So I've, I've told my students all along, don't be as concerned about what I think as much as you should be concerned about your peers. Because ultimately, you grow together with your peers. They're the ones that you need to develop the relationship with. One of the ways I think we can really improve mental wellness on campus is to have the fourth year students and the third year students be there right off the bat for the first year students. Learning a little bit about risk um, about um, what it, why when students enter a new environment, it may put them at higher risk for developing um, stress or anxiety related uh, challenges. And where else than a university to study this and determine the best way to serve young people's mental wellness? So I think that one of the proposals that I've put in front of Minister Bennett is to bridge the universities into a learning health system approach for post-secondary wellness and um, make the students not be subjects, but be participants yeah. in their own wellness. I mean, I think the future of health is that you're not an object of a healthcare system, but you're a participant in your own wellness. And what a great place to start is in the area of mental health, because arguably, we need to have a system. I mean, you know, uh, one of the things that Bev and I would talk about a lot, right, is why, why don't we have a, a well-constructed system for mental health that we have, for example, for cardiac health? Why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons, one of which is that mental health services, a lot of them are delivered 
outside of a psychiatrist's office right. in the community. Yeah. And if we start to think about that, and by the way, you might consider the university part of the community, and so we need to take a holistic approach mm -hmm. to delivering the best services and make the students feel as though their mental wellness is a, as just important as the, the playing field. So we have a mental health strategy. Paul's in fourth here. Tell us about your experience in terms of how you've, you know, whether, what kind of um, challenges you faced, how you've supported your peers, and how the university supported you. Yeah, I just want to mention, uh, I think stigma is so important that we discuss in terms of mental health. And I have noticed that a lot of my professors will open up you know, their lecture at the beginning of the semester and, and talk about mental health and go through the different resources that we have here on campus. And I think to me as a student, that's very meaningful and impactful that I have someone there for me who's able to support me as well and a university that is here to support me. Uh, I know as well the university for all students, we have the access to the wellness services and we have access to counselors as well. And I think that's uh, very valuable. But uh, I think overall just having that support system in the university is very important. I've also been employed at the university as well, uh, working within residence. So I have had experiences where you know, first year students are away from home for the first time, um, you know, away kilometers, thousands of kilometers from home uh, with no support system and having to deal with um, students talk about suicidal ideation, for instance, is something that the university has trained their employees to do as well. So I think that as well, uh, both from the professor side and the teacher side as a student, but also as an employee as well, I, I do feel supported uh, in terms of having to deal with these challenges. When you were dealing with some of your first year residents, um, were there times when you s stood back and thought, I wish I could do X for that student? Oh, many times, many times, definitely. Um, you know, we're told we need to connect people to the resources, right? And, and I don't have the sufficient training, obviously, to be able to deal with these issues. But uh, I think it's also important as well to realize that you're not gonna be able to do everything for yeah. this person and there's other people who are better suited to do that. Um, so it definitely, that was challenging at times to think about. Dr. Kelly, you, you know, you've got residents, you're in the hospital, I'm curious as to how, I mean, and everybody's been so stressed the last two years. How have you seen the conversation about mental health in the hospital change, and how have you supported the people around you so that you can continue to do what you want to do for your patients? Yeah. Um, and make yeah. sure that we still have a healthcare system, because. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the, um, the fact that we're talking about this uh, in, in many forms mm. is just an, an incredible advance that you know, we've seen, I think in recent times, just over the last few years, um, and, and I think that's probably, the, you know, the, the most important starting point uh, for all of us, um, you know, in society, um, at the hospital, in our jobs, our school, our employment, um, and it, it's become, you know, particularly important through the pandemic. Um, you know, the hospital, we see it, because there's a huge amount of support and recognition of, you know, uh, mental wellness, mental health uh, through the pandemic. So I think that's really brought it to the forefront. Um, and yet people are very stressed and people are choosing to step back or leave. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's multifactorial. Um, I, and I think it's been a very interesting uh, response, uh, you know, of individuals and, and how they've dealt with new, this new stressor that none of us anticipated. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are many, many factors that go into that. I, I don't think we could ever begin to fully understand it, you know, um, for the people that have been impacted, for, you know, for, and the, the reasons for why they've altered their, you know, their work, their lifestyles, that, that sort of thing. I, I, I think, that, you know, as you alluded to just uh, at the opening of the session, mental health is just such a vast and complex issue. You know, I, I really think Sam is actually g g trying to create another career for himself because he's just, you know, opening this Pandora's box of, uh, uh, you know, of, of um, you know, potential for a thousand li lives of work to be done, you know, in, in, in mental health. So, um, yeah, I think we're just scratching the fad? Here. That I'm not a fad, but do you think we've sort of, we're talking about it now, is it going to stick? What sticks in this conversation about mental health? 
<laughs> well, post-COVID. I, I think that um, it seems as though uh, if one uses the, uh, the parliament as a barometer, that regardless of party, um, regardless of age, regardless of sex, gender, um, people now understand that um, trauma is a huge element of our society, whether it happens uh, as a consequence of early experiences or, for example, the moral injuries that healthcare workers suffered during COVID, that not addressing it puts our entire society at risk. This was never seen that way before. There's just been a, uh, a renewed sort of sense of thinking that we have a, a responsibility around people's mental wellness that is as important as any other area of health. I don't think this is uh, a passing fancy. I think this is here to stay. Now, there may be different views on <clears throat> where the responsibility lies for this. Um, but I think if we take the position that everybody has a role to play in mental wellness, um, individuals, their families, caregivers, health practitioners, um, leaders in society. In fact, one of the very important things that the experts tell me about um, what do we do in particular in the, in the context of the healthcare workforce is to develop a concept called trauma-informed leadership so that the leaders who often are not on the front lines understand mm -hmm. what those on the front lines are experiencing so that they can better adjust and respond to their needs uh, in a manner that is respectful and uh, learned. And this is a, a different way of thinking that we're hoping to see be part of the next generation of leadership uh, because um, COVID's impact will be felt mm -hmm. in people's mental wellness for at least a decade based on previous experiences of a trauma that was more focused in whether it was natural disasters or others, is that this wave that comes after the initial yeah can stay up there for a long period of time. If it's not addressed collectively, um, again, we risk not only the health of the general population, but the health workforce, public safety workforce. Um, we've got to pay a lot of attention to this. And I think that there is a, a broad agreement at every level from communities to provinces and territories to the federal government that we need to pay attention to it, and it's for the long haul. Dr. Adams, I, I think you've probably yeah. got a lot to say about this. <laughs> I have to have the last word. So. The echo pandemic. <laughs> so, before we get off this, but um, no, I mean, I think that, that the things that stick for me are, are the, uh, the early intervention piece, and, and we have that opportunity at the University of Calgary. And the other thing I heard tonight, I mean, when I think about when I started in psychiatry, um, you didn't talk about mental illness at all. And I guess I just would like to emphasize that point, and I raise it every time I can, because I think we're all becoming comfortable talking about mental wellness and, and what that means and mental health. But I still find a bit of resistance to talk about mental illness and what that means and to understand when that transition occurs, which occurs in our, in our group at, at this university. And the key is to identify it, but also to intervene early. And so I'm so pleased to see that we're starting to talk about mental health. And, you know, to your point, Sam, earlier about how, you know, we can talk about mental illness as we would a, a cardiac disease yeah. or a, a brain tumor. And those are the things that stick for me. Yeah, you often hear people who are suffering from mental health challenges say, well, no one's coming to visit me. But if I had a broken leg, they'd come and visit me. But they don't know what to do. Yeah, I think the comfort level in, this, in discussing, understanding mental illness uh, has grown considerably. Uh, it's been significantly destigmatized. Where I'm concerned is, is, as I mentioned before, how much of a challenge we have in addiction. Uh, and in the opioid crisis in particular, um, I, I, I remember I was uh, presenting to uh, some of the ministries about the fact that um, 
you know, this is not a problem of the Lower East Side of Vancouver, nope. that the numbers per capita in North Eastern BC were just as high as they were in inner city Vancouver. And that um, this is not a sign of weakness uh, of a subset of individuals. It's everybody that we know is at risk because some people have a greater susceptibility. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about the fact that when you have a, a, a surgery, you're prescribed uh, opiates, um, eight out of 10, um, you know, we'll stop using the opiates, return them to the pharmacy, but it could be as two out of 10 or more might develop a dependence on it. And then once, of course, they ask for more and are denied, the next thing you know, the toxic drug supply could take their lives. Okay. This could happen to anyone, and it's not their fault, and they do, should not be victimized as a consequence. I actually think it's a human rights issue. And these are the types of conversations that we're having in Ottawa in order to ensure that there's an understanding, and it comes back again to literacy. When we talk about mental health literacy, it's that people understand that this shouldn't be seen as a weakness or a value judgment. It's a health matter. So healthcare is still a provincial jurisdiction. Yep. And so how do you make sure that that's, you know, not only is it supported provincially, but the resources are brought to bear so that you can actually address the issues? So the approach we're taking, uh, as I described, for the integrated youth services is quite interesting because today we were meeting with um, the national leaders on substance misuse. Uh, including the leaders of indigenous communities across the country. And what we talked about was taking an all of Canada approach from the bottom up to convince um, provincial governments, um, as well as uh, the governing um, of uh, self-governing uh, First Nations, uh, Inuit communities, that um, we have to share the knowledge and be able to create, again, a, an all pan-Canadian approach to serving uh, substance use as not seen as, uh, again, a, a matter of some deserve and others don't, but everybody in the country deserves to be properly served when they have a substance use challenge or a behavioral addiction. And if the, if the communities come together, as they have for integrated youth services first, they're the ones who can knock on the doors in cities, in communities, and get provinces to start to see that they have to do this. If it comes from the top down, it won't have the same impact no. as it does from the bottom up. So we have to develop this kind of level of connectivity from community up, and that's where the services are mostly delivered, especially for substance use, as well as for many of the mental health services. So that's, what I'm, that's why I'm proud of what Calgary is doing, because they're taking it on as a city and they're lucky to have a great university to partner with because, by the way, again, if you don't have a university, yeah. you're at a disadvantage. Minister Bennett suggests that every doctor in the country should be a faculty member somewhere. And the idea being that in order to stay uh, productive, you need to be connected to the post-secondary institutions yeah. where knowledge doesn't discriminate. Yeah, it's true. Questions from the floor? Anybody have any questions? Oh, okay. Stephanie with the microphone. It's on. Okay, hi. Um, I'm a former molecular neuroscientist turned neuropsychologist. I used to work next door to Sam. Hi. <laughs> um, access. Uh, so, psychology is not covered under healthcare yet, psychiatry is. Um, so, my colleagues and I are taking a strategy for access to do things like sliding scales, right? So it's $225 an hour to see a psychologist. If you want a diagnosis for a learning disability, that's neuropsych testing, that's $3,000 in the community right now. Yeah. Um, or a really long wait list, maybe with AHS. So, you know, I think it was the Globe and Mail published a really great five paper article in 2014 on why mental health should be covered by MSP. Um, just like everything else is, um, thoughts on how to get provincial governments to cover mental health for access. Well, um, 
Yep. Thank you for that question. I know he wasn't, a, he's not a plant, but uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, you know, the UK, I think, provides the best model for what needs to be done, right? So um, in this country currently, it's only medical services that are insured for all Canadians and allied health services are not. Arguably, both psychotherapy and physical therapy should be available to all Canadians who need it, starting first and foremost with those who need it the most, low socioeconomic status, racialized minorities, refugees and immigrants, and indigenous communities. That's where we need to start. Um, the Liberal government, current government, has committed to uh, improving access, free access to evidence-based services for those who need it the most. It will require not just working with the provinces and territories, but also increasing the numbers of trained psychotherapists in this country, just as the UK did, and start with the most vulnerable populations first, and those that can afford it the least first, which is not unlike other types of social services that are provided on a sliding scale based on uh, people's economic status. So there are models for doing this. I don't think the provinces and territories are against it. It's just that the healthcare system itself right now is always operating at the max. It's already operating like with, within the smallest margin of error. So it's a question of developing a new strategy as, as well as companion legislation that enshrines the right for these services for every Canadian. And the Canadian mental health transfer, which was likely going to be implemented sometime between 2023 and 2024, is slated to have companion legislation, which will make it part of the Canadian fabric. And the discussions this spring with the provinces and territories are going to explore exactly how to implement it. Because again, it's a great idea, uh, but given that we're different than the UK, where services are centrally, you know, uh, single payer, the provinces and territories are gonna to have to work together. And uh, we're, we're looking at a number of areas where they can start doing that. As I mentioned, integrated youth services is one of those. Um, perinatal mental health services also considered to be extremely important. Mm. Trauma-informed care is considered to be extremely important. Probably, like my friend Jackie Bogdan, one of the ADMs who ran the substance use branch for the last four years says, we need to think big, start small, and build from there. So I think the will is there, and I know um, Minister Bennett says often, we have to make sure that Canadians get the mental health services, the right services provided by the right practitioner at the right place at the right time. And she knows that implementation is a lot harder than the concept itself. So I'm optimistic. Dr. Kelly, Paul? You know, I, I'd just be interested to know from Sam, um, you know, what level of the educational system across the country is the concept of mental health or wellness introduced? Is it, or is it at all? Because, I, you know, certainly I don't remember anything about this, you know, growing up or, you know, through even through university. I, it, it, clearly now it's, you know, entering at least at the level of uh, university, but, you know, are we introducing this earlier? And, and certainly, it seems to me, you know, here in this discussion, that the earlier we began to introduce this concept and educate people, educate children, their parents, uh, you know, the, the more meaningful an impact we could have, uh, you know, as a society. Can we ask this the is for the Senior Associate Dean of Education <laughs> to address from a training. And then we'll ask this spring to Sam already, and so. when, We'll ask Paul to talk about when he um, oh. yeah, was interested. Oh. Yeah, no, go ahead, Bev, and then we'll turn to Paul. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, to your point, um, absolutely, through the Matheson Centre, they're introducing mental health into the curriculum, and it's currently at a grade nine level is where they're introducing it, but they're looking at before. So there's a school-based mental health project, and I know it's happening in grade nine. And so the other important piece is um, educating teachers, right, to understand, and our professors here, um, when to know that a student isn't doing well, because 
you know, you see them at school every day, and, and, and teachers know that Absolutely. something is wrong, but we have to give them the tools and the education to understand how they can intervene. So mental health literacy is being introduced into the school curriculum, and that's through the Matheson Center as, as one project. And we could argue that it could probably be a lot, a lot earlier than that, but I'm pleased to see that it's starting that way. And again, we need to teach our teachers as well so You're they can recognize Alberta Ed is introducing this. Into the, Alberta Ed is introducing this into the curriculum. Yes, that, and, through, and a project through the Matheson Mental Health uh, Research Center to introduce the curriculum and so that students learn about, you know, what, why is it that they're feeling this way? Yeah. What is depression? What is anxiety? And, you know, to the point we were talking earlier about addictions is that often it's self-medication, right? We, we are only now recognizing what anxiety is like and, and what it feels like, and I think that's been really magnified with COVID. And so we used to think that, oh, you're anxious. That's just a personality trait, just the way you are. Well, as anxiety progresses, it can be quite debilitating. And that's when self-medication occurs. And that's when addiction occurs. So again, another important point in the- I'm going to park that, because I think we can, we can unpack that in a second. But I want to hear from Paul, because he's the youngest of all of us. And just would like to know what kind of conversations about mental health and when they started. Did they start in high school? Did they start in junior high school? Yeah. Did you have to wait till you get to campus? So yeah, myself, I, I've done my education here in Alberta, at least like elementary, junior high, high school, and now undergrad. And it, in my high school, middle school, and elementary, we didn't have any of these conversations about mental health. Mm. And I knew we had a counselor who could help us with uh, any issues that we were having in terms of mental health, but we actually didn't learn about mental health. That was not until I came to the University of Calgary, actually, where I learned about wellness services, and I had professors who would talk about mental health and, and um, you know, be accommodating for students who had um, some mental health needs. So uh, I think the university has done a, a great, uh, is a great tool, I guess, for students to learn about mental health. And I think that we needed to be doing this a lot earlier, as yeah. was discussed. And I think this topic of mental health literacy as well, uh, I guess another question is, you know, parents are going to have to be involved in this, right, if we're having younger students and children with mental health needs. And they're going to have to understand what mental health is. So how do we make sure that parents have this literacy to make sure that they can support their children? And what do you think? Parents I think I think uh, it has to do with these conversations and, and getting the stigma and getting the education out to parents. Uh, how that is done, though, I think that's a very tough Cause, task. Because uh, there's 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 you know there's barriers whether it's cultural or oh you know, I was going to say like definitely with uh, cultural barriers yep. myself my you know having a, an American mother and then also a a father who's an immigrant uh, having conversations about mental health with them is is very different and I'm told you're a man you can't be feeling emotion you can't be feeling you know sad or or angry or, or any of like you can't have mental health uh, needs <laughs> for instance so I think for myself like culturally there's a lot of barriers in that sense and we're going to have to try and find ways to yeah. um, overcome those given that this is such a diverse country here in Canada. Yeah. Calgary's the third most diverse city in the country so it's you know from a, the fact that the city of Calgary's put this as an initiative is, is, is important. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I'll, I'll agree with everything that was said. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada is pioneering a series of um, school-based uh, mental health uh, awareness and literacy programs, actually quite remarkable. They they are ten year programs that um, you know are subject to rigorous evaluation of their effectiveness in schools, right uh, into elementary schools as well. And the next step will be scale and spread in various geographic jurisdictions. But I think that the impact that it has, especially with young kids, both on on the the kids and their families, will transform based on what like John was asking. This was not part of education before. It no. certainly wasn't even part of university education before. But, uh, but phys ed was. So why not mental health ed, right? I mean, we- Phys ed, mental health. I mean, though, and that, that, that line's been connected very clearly. It, well, it sure has, right? Yeah. Because we also understand that you know, physical uh, activity can have a dramatically positive impact on your mental wellness, and so they are inextricably linked, just as it is uh, in, in other domains. It's, it's, a, it's a new era, and this mentalhealthliteracy.org, if anybody goes to that website, has fantastic tools already yeah. um, that I think are being further enhanced by the kinds of projects that Bev was talking about. Um, uh, mental health literacy in schools will help prepare the next generation. 
Chancellor. was another question in the back there. Chancellor, yes. I do have a question based on this, um, this conversation right okay. here. Thanks. It's not actually a question, it's a comment. We have an 11-year-old boy. He is in middle school. And last week, within the Mental Health Awareness Week, uh, we've heard before wearing a hat, but this time the school went a bit beyond, and they asked that the students, each grade, would give tips every morning for mental health. Hmm. So each grade had to do a little bit of research hmm. on mental health and bring tips. So on Tuesday night, my kid was saying, oh, mommy, you need to buy cherries. I learned that cherries are good for sleeping, for to sleeping well, and that's important <laughs> for mental health. And then the principal sent us an email with the different uh, grades that were uh, giving a, a topic every morning. Um, and grade six had it last day on Friday. Um, and I don't remember at the moment the, the topics, but uh, they gave tips on how to stay healthy and uh, positive uh, things. Um, gratitude was one of them. So I'm very pleased to see that he's just in grade six. In ad school, I don't know if this is happening across CBE, uh, but um, students were exposed to positive tips for their mental health. So I think that's great. Did you say cherries are good for sleeping? Okay. <laughs> In the middle of winter, okay, we'll find cherries. The chancellor's <laughs> looking for cherries, right? <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Question in the back, yeah. Well, on the topic of stigma, um, there's, uh, of course, very recent research on, for example, psychedelics on treating, uh, of course, trauma, uh, depressive resistant disorders. And of course, it's, it's very recent and it's very in good data. So how do you think this is going to evolve toward the future? And how can we deal with potential stigma towards other techniques or innovations that can help with mental health, possibly? The resurgence of Timothy Leary. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to report that uh, our institute just launched a funding competition for the first randomized clinical trials for psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy in Canada. And uh, these are to treat um, uh, disorders, mental illnesses, and addictions where psychotherapy is already known to have a benefit, but that the, the, psych, the psychedelics can actually enhance the impact of the psychotherapy. And the fundamental science around it is actually incredibly strong. The clinical science hasn't yet caught up to the fundamental science. But I think that randomized trials that are done, uh, again, with professional psychotherapists, working with those who know how to administer microdoses done in an objective way will likely provide sufficient evidence to make this something that, especially because the psychedelics can actually be purified to the levels of accepted drugs. And if they are, they will get approved if they're demonstrated to be effective in a manner that will perhaps support uh, a greater number of people who need something above and beyond psychotherapy, but where other drugs are not effective. So actually, we're taking a very open view about this. As we would say here, a null hypothesis approach. Let's see what the data shows. So this is beyond ketamine, which is what another treatment that's being used. Well, cannabis. No, ketamine. ketamine. Oh, ketamine. Yeah, so ketamine is uh, uh, a, it's an anesthetic, but it also has psychotropic actions. Um, and it's already been approved for certain mm -hmm. treatment-resistant depression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now we're talking about other types of illnesses, including post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as addiction. So um, stay tuned for what psilocybin may offer. Uh, if it's rigorously tested, um, uh, it, it will offer hope for those who have also treatment-resistant uh, mental illnesses or addictions. Dr. Kelly, when you went through med school, <laughs> I'm guessing psil psilocybins were not in your pharmacology class. I, I didn't read about them. Uh, you know, they're, <laughs> they're Did the, you experiment? Uh, <laughs> I won't, I won't, won't make that comment here. This is being videotaped. So. <laughs> uh, well, it, I mean, it's incredible to see, you know, how um, people are 
using these chemicals that uh, you know we've shunned for many years, yeah. uh, certainly in the medical community, and uh, and trying to do good things with them. Um, and uh, let's hope that they do provide another avenue where we can, you know, effectively treat them or, or add them to our treatment regimens yeah. for certain disorders. Uh, of course, the you know the the biggest issue again will be the risk for using them as drugs of abuse. And, yeah. and I think it'll be a fine balance, um, you know, walking uh, walking that line between efficacy and and abuse. Suffice to say that. Paul's medical school curriculum is going to be a whole lot different because it'll be so integrated from so many different perspectives, right? From, a, from brain health to pharmacology and everything in between. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as Bev would readily point out, you know, the more complex and severe mental illnesses are the most challenging mm -hmm. uh, for uh, modern medicine. And being able to consider alternative approaches really would increase hope for people with severe mental illnesses. It's particularly timely now because the government is uh, in the second year of discussing medical assistance in dying as it relates to mental illness, right. um, which uh, is a slippery slope for some people. Yeah. And I think by having ongoing efforts, so you know, we talk about a, a, a subset of ways that we can approach moderate to severe, uh, mo sorry, mild to moderate mental illness. But for the severely mentally ill, it's important that research never, ever stops to look for improvements so that the quality of life remains high. Um, and that's why these types of approaches done rigorously could offer hope for many people around the world. I want to talk about intergenerational trauma and epigenetics and just talk about how all the research that's all the work that's being done now and how that helps from a community standpoint i think of you know when we think about first nations communities and the intergenerational trauma and the progress that's being made and how important it is to address that in helping um, people deal with their mental health issues and where are we yeah it's um it's it's uh well for our indigenous communities in particular this is uh incredibly vexing and tough issue, um, not only because it hasn't been that long since uh, the most recent traumas were experienced, but uh, with uh, uncovering the graves and the residential schools has re-traumatized Canada's indigenous community at, at the level of 100%. And what our indigenous communities, as well as indigenous scholars speak to is how do we ensure that the next generation and the generation after that no longer live in a life of trauma and death? Um, so it's, it's quite severe in certain populations. And of course, those of us who are the children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, um, we've seen, even yeah. in our own families, the impact of intergenerational trauma. It doesn't go away. Um, Epigenetics is a, a, a rapidly developing field. It's relevant for cancer as much as it is for uh, mental illness. And new and very exciting approaches for therapies are being developed. And I can tell you that indigenous communities are quite keen to participate in the research so long as it's done respectfully, culturally appropriate, and that the communities themselves can benefit from the knowledge as it happens, right? So it comes back to this notion of um, with us, not about us, or, you know, has yeah. to be critically important. And I don't think, I think we can learn from the indigenous communities that that's the way all people who are interested in improving their health outcomes need to be treated as part of the solution and not as an object of investigation or care. Yeah. So uh, great learnings there. The clock says zero. We have a young, inspiring medical student. I'd like each of you to offer some thoughts in terms of what you hope he's going to learn that's different from what you learned. <laughs> hmm. What do you wish you learned in medical school that you hope will be, is taught? I'm not going to say the next, to the next medicine. generation of doctors. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, we were just talking about how, you know, the, the 
burgeoning of information in medical school and how we've always taught it by, you know, there's preclinical and then there's clinical and then you're good to go. Um, not the case. And so we've got some new programs where you're going to learn about precision medicine and, and the whole notion of innovation and entrepreneurship. And so I'm quite excited about our new program. But um, that piece is ever changing and you need to keep on top of that. And I think we need to bring that into the educational realm, which is what we're doing. But above all, my advice is it's uh, a privilege to hear patient stories. And as a psychiatrist, I, I get to do that, and it's, it's amazing. And I've learned the most about, about myself as well as others, and never forget that that's uh, an entrusted privilege. And that's my advice going forward. So it's kind of the yin and yang of precision medicine, but never forget that there's a patient in front of you. Dr. Kelly? Yeah, I, I, I would echo what, uh, what Beva said. I, you know, I, I think the most important thing you can do, you know, in this life and as a physician is, uh, is just treat every human being as a human being yeah. and, uh, you know, with empathy and compassion. And, um, yeah, and, and you, you can never go wrong doing that. Um, and you have a very rewarding career in life, you know, doing that. And, and I think as Bev says it, you meet an incredible group and uh, number of people, human beings, you know, through this profession, which, which uh, is a huge privilege. Uh, and it, it's incredibly interesting and rewarding. And so I would just, you know, I'd embrace that. And, and uh, yeah, have a, a great career. I'm not a physician. I'm a I know. just a you're just a researcher. PhD. I made you an honorary psychiatrist. You did now. you did? I appreciate. It. You know the difference between PhD and MD? Sorry. The difference between PhD and MD? If I know the difference. Do you know what the difference is? What did what did the letters stand for? Uh, maybe not. I thought I did. Maybe. <laughs> doctor yeah. philosophy PhD. and then medical doctor. No, no. <laughs> Phony doctor. Uh. <laughs> Money doctor. <laughs> Depends on the research funding. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even respond. <laughs> you don't dare, John. You don't dare. <laughs> One more question from the floor. If not, I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, there is a question from the floor. Uh, this is more for Paul than anyone. Sorry. Sorry, Dad. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, dear. Um, I have the privilege to work at the Matheson Center on Child and Youth Mental Health, and my interest throughout my whole life really has been um, the use of animal therapy for, for mental health. And I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts um, coming from your generation, if people that you know or in your community would be interested in that, um, especially uh, multicultural as well as age-wise. Yeah. Sorry. What was the therapy called? Uh, animal. Animal therapy. Animal therapy. Yeah. Oh, I actually, I do. So um, it's interesting you bring that up because I do have an autistic sister actually, and we were looking at maybe um, getting like a support animal for her. But uh, in terms of my actual peers, like using that, I don't. I haven't really met anyone who does do that. But I think like uh, overall. I feel like a lot of people would be open to that. Uh, making sure, though, that it's evidence-based, obviously, uh, first and foremost. But I think these, these new and novel therapies are something that we should be using going forward. And uh, I would be really curious to hear about um, how these therapies are being used in our generation, but also in our world as well. Yeah, there's not a, not a lot about it um, online, but yeah, it would be really interesting. So thank yeah. you. Thanks. OK, I think that's. That's, that's time. Um, I just want to say thank you for everybody for staying for, this, for the conversation. I know that there's a lot more that we could be unpacking, but we just don't have the time to do that. I want to thank everybody for the work that they're doing uh, on a daily basis and not giving up. Because sometimes there's probably moments where you just feel like it might just be not worth it, but you don't. Yeah, fatigue. Maybe you're, it's not that you're fatigued, you're weary. It's different. <laughs> But you are making changes. You're making a difference in all of our communities. And I want to thank you for being here tonight. And again, thank you to Dr. Weiss for honoring us with his lecture of a lifetime, which was truly a fabulous lecture. <laughs> <laughs>